We really have to sneak up on mystery. Like if we try to use our part, mm, you know, it's like people to, uh, don't, you know, so we, and we have to sneak up on, on ourselves. So we use something called easy focus. It's one of our first tools. And, um, you know, being able to not over focus, overlook, uh, overwork. That's really powerful. And so if we wanted to invite people to breathe or to do anything, the first thing we would do is release them from any obligation, right? And so that's the attitude that we bring. Obligation tends to immediately communicate as, what am I supposed to do? How am I, I mean, people move it directly towards their judge, their questions of comparison. So the more I can send the message and believe the message myself that it doesn't really matter, <laughs> you know. Um, let's take a deep breath and let it out with a sigh because it'll probably feel good. Let's try it. Ah, you know, it, that kind of a, an approach is more fun. That's on our, that was on our list of things to do as we created <laughs> in, this, in, in this work together. Yeah. It's on our list. Um, maybe the most important thing. Um, is it fun? So that, because if it's fun, then we know we're in the realm of where, what the body wants. The body wants to have fun. It does not want to be interrogated. It's the simplest thing to ask people to do. <laughs> you know, if you're going to ask, if you invite people into their physicality, actually breathing, and then the thing that we always add to it is this kind of audible sigh, so it's not just, it's really, <sighs> um, and even bigger. So the, the vibration in the body that happens when you sigh audibly e actually even intensifies the experience of what it means to breathe. But it also makes it obvious, do you know? And everyone can do that. So even you know, the folks who are sitting in their chairs and they're not gonna move very far, they are still breathing and you can probably make them breathe a little bit bigger and you can probably make them make that sound, although the first couple of times it'll be, it'll be quiet, it'll be polite. Um, but that's, you know, it's just an easy thing to ask people to do. And if there's probably one thing that Cynthia and I are going to be remembered for, it's going <laughs> to be that we made people breathe and sigh out loud. So, and shake. Yeah, and shake things out. So, yeah. um, so that's part, partly it. And it just has such a profound effect, a profound and immediate effect on us to even do that. So we don't even, you know, there's, a, there's something about our work where <clears throat> There's a kind of irreverence, or a kind of we we want to play this side of seriousness, partly because we are so serious and we know we need that other part, but also so it's not like such a big deal. Um, so even though you know it's like in some traditions, which I don't discount, of course, but um, in some traditions, you know, that's a very serious process. We're gonna breathe. We're gonna be conscious of our breathing, and you know, and, and we're gonna sit very still and we're gonna pay very close attention. It's kind of like that, you know. <laughs> Um, and we just, we kind of do it almost as a throw off. Yeah, for me, limits, understanding limits. The f good fortune I had as a person trained in a dance studio was that, first of all, I had to recognize what my capacities and limits were for my body. Um, I'm. It turns out I'm not a great ball ballet dancer because my hip sockets are too deep and my legs don't literally turn out. They turn in. And while that is a kind of, you can think, okay, well that's, okay, she can't be a ballet dancer. What's that good, what's that good for, you know? Um, it also, though, extends to what happens when you fall down. How do you fall down? What are the limits of falling down? And to know that in a body, like as children, we rehearse all of that information, but to hold on to that rehearsal as with conscious contact, to fall, to be able to fall, to know that I am falling, to know that what it is to be fallen, to know what it is to transgress, to push somebody over, to know that when that's an accident and when it's intentional, to know these things on the root level, on the physical level, is where the <laughs> where the actual reality is. It's what people call reality. You know, I just, <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's like, that, isn't that something we should be in? I don't know, <laughs> you know. Um, I think so. So to get back to the body, close to the body, you get close to the thing 
that people call, talk about when they talk about the now, when they talk about be present, you know, when it's how do you deal with discomfort, you know, that these are all physical. So, you know, the, I think that limits um, and capacities, like my dad ran 100 miles often as a, a runner, um, a pioneer in the cross country running thing, and he, he just blew my mind in, a, as an 80 year old that he was doing that. So what's, what are we c capable of too? We can see it in the Olympics. People are, we're always capable of something greater. And so that p interplay of limits and possibilities and the ex exploration of that, what is it to, for me to be a human? I, I have no idea. I'm still trying to figure it out. And now that I'm 63, you know, uh, in a ballet class where I can't turn out, um, what am I capable of? Why do I love ballet more now? Or why do I, why am I so, um, so having even, I mean, so much more grief, so much more friction in, in my lived experience as I, I test my capacities out around the harm that's been done and how to lend myself to a better way. You know, that's painful, it's hard, and it's limits, the limits of my physicality and the need to depend on others and, and a whole circle of people working together and then uh, the whole creation. I, you know, I feel that so deeply.